Good day, uh, my name is Michael Molondo and I am the tutor for the subject Health Education 3. Um, the code is HE30S3 and it's a standalone program. So the purpose of this presentation is to uh, will be divided in two parts. The first part is going to look at uh, examination itself, how you can prepare yourself for the exam uh, before you go and write the exam. Then I'm also going to look at, uh, during this part, at uh, what are you going to do during the exam, when you're going to write the exam. So I'm going to look at the issue of before the exam and then also during the exam. Then the second part of this presentation is going to look at the content of the subject itself. I'm going to have what I call the examination scope or the exam scope. Uh, some of the things that you have to look at during the exam but please remember, um, it does not mean that you do not need to read through the whole study manual. It is still expected from you as a student to have a broad and a better understanding on the context and the content of the subject. So advisably, please read through the whole subject, through the whole chapters, so that you can understand what is expected from you uh, as a student and what you have to do to make sure that you are going to uh, 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 answer the question that are going to be asked uh, uh, from you. So the first thing is we're going to look at before the exam. So advisedly two months before you write the exam, sometimes we can take a month before where you need to draw up a timetable. Uh, the timetable is uh, only a way to uh, commit yourself and to discipline yourself. So you will need a lot of self-discipline when you draw up the time timetable and you must make sure that you commit yourself. So uh, a chapter or a subject can have like 10 units or 10 chapters. So advisedly you can divide those chapters or those units uh, over a period of two months. You can have two chapters in a week, three chapters, one chapter, it all depends on you. Uh, you can have it a month before or two months before. Now there are three things that you have to look at when you are going to prepare the timetable. The first thing is you have to read through the, the content um, uh, of your book. Uh, and the reason of, of, of reading is you ha need to read in order to understand the context. Uh, many people, uh, students, they make the m mostly this mistake where they want to uh, start to study or to memorize uh, the, the subject right away. It's very important that before you memorize, before you study, you have to understand the content. So while you are reading it as part of your understanding, uh, you have to make some notes. Uh, preferably you can make a circle, you can underline keywords, uh, concepts, that will help you. You can make additional notes, you can use additional resources like the internet resources, printed and electronic media, making notes, you can write it in your study manual, but as long as you keep notes, because these notes are very important. Thirdly, when you start to revise, all these notes that you have made for the last two months or one month will help you to better revise uh, for your exam and to do revision as part of. And preferably, it, it's advisable that you can revise uh, at least a week before the exam starts. Uh, the mistake that most students do is they start to revise or they want to memorize the whole book uh, a day or two days before they're going to write the exam. So make sure that you give yourself ample time, enough time to prepare yourself, to make sure that you understand the context and, 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 and the subject at large. Then after you have prepared yourself and you know what the subject is all about, then uh, you find yourself writing the exam. And uh, these are actually advice that I want to give you through experience I had with students. When you are going to write the exam, this is during the exam, you have the paper in front of you. The first thing that you have to do before you answer the questions or you write on your script, read through all the questions. The reason why you have to read through the, all the questions is secondly, is while you are reading through the, all the questions, you want to identify the questions that are easier to answer. Uh, mind you that, that you only have two hours to answer this question, or the, uh, two hours during the exam, or maybe three hours, depends 
on the paper. Uh, when you are going to start with a difficult question, you will find yourself with limited time. By the time you, you reach the easiest question, then you discover that you don't have enough time. So make sure that you read to understand and you prioritize the question and then you select the questions that are the easiest. Then thirdly is, now you have identified and you select the questions that are easy, then read again those questions that you're going to answer. Before you're going to write, read the question in order to understand the question. Because if you understand the question in number four, you will be able to answer the question. Because it's very important and when you answer the question, it does not say you have to interpret the question or assume this is what the question is all about. So make sure that when you are going to write the question, you answer the question that are being asked. So these are the practical tips and guidelines that you can use as part of your preparation uh, for the exam. So we're going to go to the second part of, of this presentation and uh, we're going to look at the content. So the content of the subjects look at different aspects and as I said uh, earlier before, uh, a student is not limited to read through the whole manual. It's still important for you to study the whole manual, uh, to know and to have an understanding on the whole context of the, of, of the subject itself. So these are just guidelines, uh, possible guidelines that you can use, but at the end of the day, it's still expected for you to understand the whole subject. So the first thing is about positively living. Now, positively living does not mean uh, that you are HIV positive and you must live with your status. It means that even if you are HIV positive, even if you have a chronic disease in you, it's very important that you must have a positive mind. So your mindset is very important and we have talked about this in the past so many times, how you can live. Uh, we have discussed that, I have made presentation um, so I will uh, suggest that you look at previous presentation on, on YouTube that, that extensively covered the, the whole aspect of positively living. Uh, many people, um, they know they are HIV positive and they live for many years. And uh, it's not just the ARV or the medication that they're using, but it's also your mindset. Psychologically, you have to make sure that you are positive. You have to think positive. Uh, think in a sense that you have a future. Your status does not determine your future. You can still have children. You can still start a family. You can still live for the next 20, 50 years, if possible. It all depends on your lifestyle. And positively living also means that you need to have a healthy lifestyle. It won't help that you are on medication and your lifestyle is not healthy. And when I mean with lifestyle, is alcohol and drug abuse, uh, multiple partners, uh, unprotected uh, sexual intercourse. Uh, so many examples that I can give. So it's very important that when you are living positively, you have to make sure that everything is in your mindset. So your mind, your psychological uh, status would will actually determine, our uh, mindset will actually determine uh, whether you will live longer or not. So it's very important that you have to discuss that. So if there's any question in the exam, uh, a question that where it's requested from you to, to discuss this. So you can also look at different psychological theory for an example. Um, sometimes it can happen that people are in a certain uh, m mindset or what I call paradigm or a, or a men, men, mental state that they don't think positively. And, uh, and this is also the reasons why people are committing suicide because they find themselves in a situation they ask, they, where they are chronically sick and they feel that there is no solution. Uh, they feel that there is no hope for them. Uh, they feel that there is no future for them. And that's why many people, because of that, commit suicide or they think that suicide is the, the, the solution. So it's very important that you have to look and, and, and explain in detail what these words 
what the definition is of this word and also give some practical example uh, how you can apply it uh, as much as possible. So make sure that when you're going to discuss this in your exam paper, you have to cover uh, this whole aspect as, as I've mentioned before. So you go through all that aspect, you cover it and, 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 and you look into it as much as possible. Then the other thing is clinical monitoring. Now, um, it's very important, and clinical monitoring is actually looking at people that are on ARV. Now, if you are on ARV, it's very important that uh, your medical doctor or your doctor has to, you have to go for test, uh, say every uh, certain periodically, say, whether it's every two months or whether it's a month, it all depends on your medical practitioner. And the reason why you go for a, a blood test uh, uh, while you're on ARV is actually to see whether the uh, ARV is working. Secondly, is to look at your viral load and then also to look at your T-cells uh, or your CD4 counts. And uh, your CD4 count is very important, especially uh, when it comes uh, to your healthy living. And um, many a times uh, people are on ARVs and, and, and then they default or anything happen and if there is no monitoring, no blood test on a periodic or from time to time, uh, uh, you find some people that are defaulting and, and, and then um, uh, they have problems of adherence and, and, and it can become more. So clinical monitoring is very important. So in your paper, you have to define what is clinical monitoring. Then you have to explain what does it entail. Then you have to explain and also discuss the benefit of having clinical monitoring. Why do you need clinical monitoring? Uh, disadvantage if you don't have clinical monitoring, for example, if patients are not being monitored. So this is where you have to look in detail why it's very important that you have to look into that. Now, uh, uh, when you are going for your HIV test, uh, uh, and you know that uh, your status is positive. Um, now, it's very important that you need to have a doctor-patient relationship. Uh, with your medical practitioner, your medical doctor, you have to have a relationship. And this is mostly the time where you have to be open. And uh, especially when it comes to your lifestyle, um, because your lifestyle can also have a big effect, as I mentioned earlier, on your positively living or on your loving. Uh, so when you are going to be monitored, make sure that you have a healthy lifestyle, that you are looking after yourself. And then of course, uh, you are also on a healthy diet and a balanced diet, uh, which is very, very much important. Now, technology has changed so much nowadays that uh, people can actually go for self-test. But uh, preferably, uh, this clinical monitor does not mean self-testing. It actually means that you go to uh, your medical doctor, blood is been taken, and then they send it to a laboratory, and where you go get uh, then uh, your results. And based on your results, that your uh, medical treatment can be adhered to or can be adjusted or it can be reinforced. So clinical monitoring is very important, especially for those uh, that are on ARV. Then um, you, in this subject, you have to know ARVs. Now, ARV is very important, uh, as I mentioned also earlier before. Now, there are different groups of ARV. So there is the first regimen, the second regimen, hopefully the third regimen, depends in which country you are staying. Now, um, ARV treatment has become so advanced for the last 10 years. Um, and you can also in your paper discuss the technological uh, the development and also the development of ARV treatment. And, and then in your discussion on the development of ARV treatment, you must also talk about how it developed. You also have to look at then the challenges. Uh, what challenges are being faced still when it comes to ARV. Um, then you have to look at best practices, the successes, 
that have been reached. Now, when you look at the different groups of ARV, uh, you have to have at least an understanding on what they are, what they entails. Now, when you are looking at it, now each group of ARV are having different function. Now, today we have what we call the smart pearl. Uh, the, the smart tablet, which means you only have one tablet or two tablets that are using. Uh, looking at the last 10 years where you had a handful of tablets as part of your ARV, now you only have a magic tablet or a magic bullet, as I call it, one tablet or two tablets. So it has so much developed, um, and, uh, but for the sake of the subject, um, uh, it's very important important for you to understand from where ARV is coming from and where we are now. And it all starts with the groups, so you have to understand the different group. And um, uh, preferably I will advise you to read the current uh, ARV uh, guidelines, uh, the treatment, a ARV treatment guidelines, the ART uh, guidelines uh, which are being updated by the Ministry of Health uh, from time to time. So read through those guidelines just to have a current knowledge on the groups of ARV, where we are with regard to ARV, and which ARV uh, are being ad administered to in Namibia. Uh, and then you can also look at other countries. Uh, what, what are the best practices? What are the challenges? For example, you look at Zambia, you look at Botswana, uh, Namibia compared to that uh, and it's not just the uh, the uh, uh, availability of ARV but also discuss the accessibility of ARV. Uh, ARV are available but do people have access to ARV? So discuss those different aspects and then also the, the misuse of ARV uh, the current uh, trend that people are using ARV as a drug you know as a way of getting high. So you can also discuss those things, you know, how people are abusing ARV as part of a drug intake or as part of a drug abuse, especially those that are drug addicts uh, that are using ARV as part of a complement, as a supplement for a drug. So discuss that also in detail, how uh, it's very important. Then, of course, which is very important, while you are on ARV, uh, there are certain side effects. Um, now, not everyone uh, has the same side effects. You have some people uh, uh, depend on your CD4 count, all depends on the viral load, also depends on your T, 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 T cells or your immune system, and that some people uh, respond differently uh, to ARVs. Uh, so, discuss that. What, what, what possible side effects can, can somebody experience that's on ARV? And, and how are they managing this ARV? If you are having a side effects, how uh, is this addressed? How is this managed? So discuss this in your paper and give practical example. Uh, how do they manage side effects? Uh, because there are many symptoms, asthmatic uh, uh, condition, uh, where patients uh, are on ARVs and suddenly they're experiencing a rash or they experience diarrhea, or they experience vomiting, and uh, and then it's nothing else but just ARV. Um, so that's why, uh, as I decided uh, mentioned before about clinical monitoring. Uh, clinical monitoring is very important because if you adhere uh, to clinical monitoring and you visit your medical doctor from time to time, uh, the issue of side effect will be addressed and it's very important. So in your paper discuss uh, the impact it has on a human being um, and, and what do you do as a patient when you experience the side effects uh, how do you manage it, for example, uh, as a patient uh, when it comes to ARV treatment and so on. So it's very important for you to look through it and as I said earlier, uh, you can consult uh, the current ART guidelines uh, which are being uh, uh, monitored and even updated by the Ministry of Health and Social Services. Then the other thing is now the HIV itself. Now, HIV infection is one of the things uh, which is very, very important, especially for, for the subject. Now, in your paper, you have to 
first discuss about HIV infection. And then after you have discussed about the HIV, you first start about the HIV virus. What is the HIV virus? You can even differentiate between HIV and AIDS. Now coming to the HIV virus, the moment the HIV virus or the HIV virus go into your bloodstream, what happens with that infection? And then you can even give a diagram. Uh, you can even give a diagram of explanation on the life cycle of HIV. You know, how does the virus replicate itself in your bloodstream? And uh, from the stage of infection, where the virus mutates itself, and how it replicates itself, and how it forms eight HIV particles, um, how negative are those particles in your HIV, Talk about the white blood cells, how the white blood cells are being affected and infected and how they uh, are being used and when they start to mutate, what happens within your body. So discuss that in detail and by now uh, it is expected from you to know exactly what are the life cycle of the HIV virus from the infection up to the part of mutation where it replicates itself, where it embeds itself. Uh, uh, so much you can talk about the, the DNA of the virus itself, the RNA, the exomes, exomes uh, of the virus itself, the different strength, you can talk about the variant, the strain. Um, you can even talk about, you know, uh, even during this time, you can also talk about the different HIV virus, HIV-1, HIV-2, HIV-3. Very important that you can bring out this information. So I will suggest that you have to go and read additional information, look at uh, other uh, information which are very important so that you can be able to answer the question. And as I said, if you have a comprehensive understanding of the subject, you know the subject, you know, or, or the, the, you understand the subject, then uh, you will be able to answer this question. Then, of course, the other one is the opportunistic infection. So now you also know, uh, uh, this is also part of your HIV life cycle. So this is now where you reach the AIDS uh, stage. Uh, you know, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So this is where you are full-blown AIDS. Whether you default or whether the ARV are not working. And then suddenly you have these infections, you know, and we call it opportunistic infections, um, that can happen. And how do you deal with this infection? Now, in your paper it is expected for you to explain what is opportunistic infection, how do you deal, what are the symptoms of this uh, infection, how do you manage this infection, how do you address the infection. So it's very important that in your uh, paper or in your, your writing you have to explain this in disease. You can give the different symptoms, the different levels uh, about your infections. Um, uh, so you have to understand, uh, 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 answer this question question and have a holistic and a comprehensive point of view. So uh, I have come to the end of my presentation and I hope that this presentation has helped you um, for your preparation for your exam and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much for listening to me. Bye.